Okay, everyone. Hello. And welcome to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission's fourth and final 2022 Women's History Month program. Thanks to the vision of Executive Director Lassiter, we were blessed to host keynotes this month by Juju Chang, Dr. Nicole Holland Sims, Jenna Maynard Baker, and today for our coup d'etat, we're welcoming the Honorable Joanna McClinton, the Democratic leader of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Welcome. Zulai Roja will tell you more about her outstanding career in a few moments. In case you're wondering, my name is Lara Argenbright, and I'm the Director of Communications for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. So on behalf of the PHRC commissioners, senior management, and staff, I would like to thank you all for being with us today, and especially all of the phenomenal women who have joined us. Thank you for all that you do. Now, as a regular part of our drill, I have to cover a few housekeeping items. Now that all our technical difficulties are worked out, we have to ask you to remain on mute throughout the program. If time allows, there will be a few moments for questions at the end of the presentation. This session is recorded and live streamed on Facebook. So just that everyone is aware, we operate the basic Zoom meeting module. So all of us are live and in the same room. That's why it's very important that you stay on mute and you're aware of your on-camera presence throughout the program. Finally, I'd like to thank Ian Fenestock, Zulai Roja, Stacy Waters, Brittany Mellinger, and Renessa Edwards, who have all had a hand in making today's program possible, as well as our interpreters from DHI who are providing closed caption and ASL services today. And with that, let's move on to the program. And Executive Director, would you like to start us off with a few words? Yes, thank you, Laura. Uh, once again, everyone, uh, welcome to what we call at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, our beloved community, where we pride ourselves on making it a safe and brave space. Uh, just really humbled and honored that we will be concluding uh, this afternoon with our last uh, installation of our Women's History Month event. Uh, and so just honored to have the Honorable Joanna E. McClinton here. I just wanted to open up with the following. She is excellent, qualified, measured, confident, knowledgeable, and proud. Uh, these are adjectives that if we see ourselves in those adjectives could be any number of us uh, as women, could be uh, some of the adjectives that we use to describe uh, what the current uh, and soon to be uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Brown Jackson is going through. Uh, I use those adjectives certainly because of what we've seen uh, this past week as it relates to no doubt that racism and sexism are still alive and thriving in our country. Uh, and we need to look no further than uh, some of the questioning of Judge Jackson. But when I think of those aforementioned words, I think of Joanna McClinton, uh, who I have uh, observed and admired from afar. Uh, and I'm just really, really uh, fortunate that all of us here at PHRC and others who are here today will be witnessing uh, and listening and learning uh, from this dynamic leader it does not yet appear uh, what the next calling is going to be for her uh, because she is an accomplished lawyer and she is an accomplished legislator. Uh, and so the sky is the limit. Uh, and so may we all just be present with our spirit uh, to listen to this dynamic woman, this dynamic social justice agent. And don't want to steal Zulai's thunder because I know she's going to read uh, the bio, uh, but I just wanted to just come into this space uh, on the hills of everything that has been transpiring this week. I think it's very important for those of us who are males who uh, rid ourselves of toxic masculinity in the way that Cory Booker did, that we step into space and advocate and speak out on behalf of women of color uh, and women uh, in general and all humanity. Thank you, Laura. And once again, looking forward to uh, this keynote this afternoon. Thank you, Executive Director Lassiter. So at this time, I'd like to introduce one of PHRC's own phenomenal women, Renessa Edwards, who will recite a woman, a woman Speaks by Audre Lorde. A Woman Speaks by Audre Lorde. Moon marked and touched by sun, my magic is unwritten. But when the sea turns back, it will leave my shape behind. I seek no favor untouched by blood, unrelenting as the curse of love, permanent as my errors or my pride. I do not mix love with pity nor hate with scorn. And if you would know me, look into the entrails of Uranus where the restless oceans pound. 
I do not dwell within my birth nor my divinities who am ageless and have grown and still seek it. My sisters, witches and Dahomey, wear me inside their coil cloths as our mother did, mourning. I have been woman for a long time. Beware my smile. I am treacherous with old magic and the noon's new fury with all your wide futures promised. I am woman and not white. Thank you. Nice, Renessa. That was beautiful. And without further ado, good afternoon, PHRC colleagues and all our virtual audience streaming this broadcast. On Monday, March 21st, 2022, we highlighted this esteemed woman's accomplishments in our National Woman's Her Story Month. But allow me to reintroduce House Democratic leader, Joanna E. McClinton. Leader McClinton was the first elected in 2015 to serve communities in West and Southwest Philadelphia, as well as Yadin and Darby, Delaware County. As a state lawmaker, she's made history not once, but twice. First in 2018, when she became the first woman and first African-American to be elected as House Democratic Caucus Chair. And again in 2020, when she was the first woman elected House Democratic leader in the institution's 244 year history, long overdue. She studied political science and leadership in global understanding and would later go on to obtain a law degree from Villanova School of Law. She was an assistant public defender for seven years and in 2013, Leader McClinton combined her passion for public service and law by becoming chief counsel to state Senator Anthony Hardy Williams, where she worked behind the scenes to develop policy and legislation. Leader McClinton has earned several distinctions for her commitment to public service. And today it is with the utmost humility that we here at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission are fortunate to host the Honorable Representative Joanna E. McClinton. Thank you for that warm welcome. Happy Women's History Month. It is so great to be here. I'm, a I'm very appreciative, of course, to your esteemed director, Chad, and to Laura, who was gracious enough to send the link. <laughs> And of course, to the uh, Sweet 16 predictions and as we waited to get started. Thank you to those from the Human Relations Commission for what you do every single day. Um, thank you to those who are watching virtually. I, of course, shared it a few times. So hopefully some of my neighbors in the 191st district are tuned in. Um, it's just a privilege to be here today. Uh, the fact that you all at the PHRC are on the front lines and our constant struggle for equality in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania just amazes me. I'm humbled to be in your presence because you all do the hardest job and that is to make sure that we have a Commonwealth that is free without discrimination to make sure that our families um, are not discriminated against um, because of our race, because of our gender, because of our identity, um, because of who we love and thank you. Honestly, I really look forward to the day when we don't need the Human Relations Commission. And I'm, you know, I'm not gonna drop any tears, but I'm very uh, serious about this. Um, you know, we wanna know that there can be a possibility of a Pennsylvania, you know, without discrimination, without prejudice. Um, and, and we know that we are continuing to make progress, progress. But the work you do is seriously just so valuable. And it's like a lot of roles. You probably don't get a lot of thank yous. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. On behalf of everyone that you all have stepped in the gap for, informed about rights, ensured that they weren't discriminated against for jobs, for housing. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I certainly have my own lived experience that I bring to my day to day as a young Black girl from Southwest Philadelphia. I know the challenges that many of my neighbors face, but I don't know, you know, the challenges that other 
minorities face, whether we're talking about trans women um, or whether we're talking about women in the LGBTQIA community, I do not know what they face. So I can only talk about my shared experience and keep both my ears open so I can listen and I can learn about women in other communities and the challenges that they have and how, in fact, you know, they add to the beauty of the diverse um, commonwealth that we have. And I know it's like a saying, a cliche, but really, our diversity is our strength. Our diversity is what makes Pennsylvania an amazing place. The fact that even in this teeny tiny corner of Southeast PA where I live, that you can drive a few miles and go to farmland, that you can drive a few miles back and be in the city and you know be downtown and or to be in South Philly looking at Sweet 16 tonight, is just amazing what we have. And that's just one pocket of our state. And when we're in Women's History Month, we get a chance to look at how far we have come and how women collectively, as we heard that great poem from our colleague um, about women, um, how much we've contributed to society, but how we have to double down on our commitment to true equality. Today, March 25th, 2022, your last series, um, but in the future, this time next year, for our daughters, for our nieces, for our goddaughters, we want them to not have to fight it the way we have, and we want to make sure that their next generation has opportunity. We know one thing in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, women, like women across the whole nation and across the world in different places and parts, we face challenges, we face hardships, whether we're talking about health care, whether we're talking about finding good, affordable childcare, whether we're talking about the pay gap, the fact that we are persistently underpaid in the workplace. You know, you get that question on the interview, what you currently making right now? What you making your last job? Not where do you want to be and how should you be compensated? I was with a person yesterday, I'm not gonna put this person on blast, but they were saying, you know, I've been working here for a while and they tell me they can't do this job without me. But when it comes up for raises, they're not giving me substantial raises to show the value. So we know that it's a very serious, difficult environment that we face challenges. Um, and then with the pandemic for you know two years of uncertainties, navigating something new in this world, some working from home, some trying to educate our children and we didn't study uh, education in college, hello. We weren't student teachers, hello. <laughs> And we're trying to look at new math in an intense way. It's one thing to look at homework, but when you are working from home, having your children on a Chromebook, Chromebook, it's just so much. And our pandemic that we are still in, it's not over. It showed the inequities that have always existed. They are not new. They have always existed. And this Women's History Month, the theme, providing healing and promoting help, it gives us the opportunity to shout out the frontline workers. That's why I thank everybody at PHRC for all you do to ensure that we're not being discriminated against. Um, but we also can also look at the fact that so many women have worked throughout the pandemic, have been the frontline workers, have been the one dropping off our groceries, have been the ones, you know, when we needed something at work, able to service us when we're going to pick up a prescription. So we know that women, we lead, we minimize what we do at home, like it's not important. But I was on a call during the pandemic, and I, I'll never forget this. The person speaking said, you know, we already run a business. We run our home enterprises. <laughs> you know, we keep the food, the lights, the everything. You know, we keep this world going. And those of us who are blessed enough to have family members to care for, whether they're children or aging parents, we keep them going to their appointments, making sure they get this, making sure they get the other. So we cannot allow ourselves and our lights to be diminished whether we're caregivers, whether we're running a household, whether we're an elected office, whether we're behind the scenes, we are leaders. And when we give our, get the opportunities, we lead. Whether we think about Eleanor Roosevelt to the young lady who's on my lapel today, I don't know if you can see her in the Zoom and Facebook, but Shirley Chisholm uh, to Kamala Harris, our vice president, we have been at the front line of change throughout centuries. And the good news is that we are just getting started. Now, you probably want to get into the ins and outs of being the first woman leader. We'll have to talk about most of that story offline. <laughs> because, of course, when you are the first, it is difficult. It is challenging. It is hard. People push. Some people push back. But let me not in any way diminish the fact that I am grateful to my colleagues 
state representatives from every part of Pennsylvania who have provided me this opportunity because those who aren't familiar, and it's okay if you aren't down in the weeds with our caucus leadership, but our members, state reps across the nation, the, well, not the nation, but across the state, they choose who they want to fill leadership roles. So the fact that my caucus, which is still mostly men um, th that do not look like me, I won't get into all the categories. I know I'm with the PHRC, that they decided we want to give this sister, this woman a chance to lead. I am so humbled and I am grateful. So I don't complain about the things that come with the first. The key for me is that I'm not the last and that there are women that go higher that one day in this Commonwealth, We'll look around and we'll see a woman in the governor's mansion. One day in this Commonwealth, we'll look around and we'll see more women in the state Senate. I mean, we have so many ways to go as it results in our public officials and women giving opportunities to lead. And I'm so thrilled that my caucus wasn't the only one to do that in November of 2020. But major shout out to State Senator Kim Ward from Westmoreland County. Senator Ward is the first woman to lead in the state Senate. And she is also the first, but guess what? The key is not just being the first, but making sure that when women see us, our colleagues and those to come say, we wanna do that too. We're, they won't be the last women leaders. So I'm very grateful for that. Additionally, when we look at how we are able to have, you know, as I just shouted out Senator Ward, you know, she's in Westmoreland. I'm in West Philly, right? <laughs> so our constituents, our views, our party affiliation, they are different, sometimes opposed at moments adverse, but we all understand we're in the state capitol to do the people's bidding. We understand that even if we have different ways to look at issues, the most effective leaders are able to drop all of what we used to think we knew. And as I said, open up our ears so we can hear somebody else's experience, so we can learn and, and just going. I'll tell you the best benefit that I've had in the last year and some months of being leader is just being in other areas of our Commonwealth, hearing from constituents in different areas, in places that are far from my home and different from my community that raised me, hearing their concerns, learning how I can fight for them from rural Pennsylvania to suburban Pennsylvania you know, the small cities, you know, Hazleton and wilkes Fair, like going around and hearing has just been so empowering because it is amazing to see that while I'm, you know, the house leader, there are women in all these places doing hard work and on the front line. So that being said, we know that representation in every single sector, it matters. In every position, it matters. Uh, let's look at a couple of numbers. Currently, there are more than 50% of women in higher education um, institutions in our colleges, our universities. Um, but somehow we have less than 10% of all Fortune 500 CEO positions. In case you missed it, we have more than 50% of higher education students and graduates for, uh, we have more degrees than men for decades outpacing them in our studies. But yet and still, we have less than 10% of Fortune 500 CEO uh, positions. And so in 2021, just last year, the number of women running businesses on that big time Fortune 500 list is an all time record of 41, 41, <laughs> not 40%. For one, only an 8%. So still a long way to go there, only 8%. So it's still a very, very long way to go there. And that 8.2% was a record, <laughs> a record high. So we have uh, quite a ways to go. And then you look at women of color in that category of Fortune 500, um, it's just at one 1%, numero uno, 1%. Um, and then when we look at politics, we are still lagging behind. Where I work in Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania has 29% um, of our positions in the House and the Senate are women, even though we're more than 50% of the population. And now use the House. We're the House of Representatives. We should be representing the population, but we're at very low, 29%. Now, I'm excited. I am a Democrat, and in my caucus, 
we are 35% women. So, you know, we're, we're inching upwards there in our representation around the state. Um, but we have so much further to go. When we look at DC um, at the federal uh, level, we know we have a woman vice president, the first one ever. We have Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House. She's the first one. She's on like her fourth round. But, you know, she's still the first woman to ever hold that gavel. And then you think about all of the other categories, whether we're talking about Latino, or whether we're talking about Asian Pacific Islanders or whether we're talking about um, LGBTQIA elected members, the numbers are very, very, very low. So we have to make sure that as we, and it's not political, but as we choose leaders, that they are reflective of our voices, our voices are heard, our voices are represented, that we are able to ensure that there are not roadblocks for people who want to get involved and want to do good. And then as we look at equal pay, I alluded to it in the very beginning, in order for Pennsylvania women to be on track to earn what men make, it would happen in, drum roll please, 2070. <laughs> Now, I can't speak for you, but I'm going to be retired by 2070, okay? <laughs> but not the, seriously, imagine 50 more years for us to just get the same wage for the same job. Nothing extra, nothing bonus, nothing exceptional, just the same wage for the same job. That is not okay. I know you all know it because we are seeing more and more women in our families being the ones who are being supportive financially. You know, the idea of what it was, you know, 60 years ago is very different of what our household looks like, who's bearing the responsibility for bills, but we still have an unfair gender pay gap and we still have to be able to get through it. Just uh, two weeks ago, March the 15th was equal pay day. That is how long it takes for white women only, to be clear, to earn what a, a man made in 2021. So you would think January 1st to December 31st. No, it would be January 1st to March 15th of the next year. And for women that are like me, Black women, it's August, almost two years to earn what was earned by a man the year prior. So we have a long ways to go. And I won't even tell you all how much the resources financially for the same work we are doing and being underpaid too often, we need this money. I mean, we're in an inflation. We need to be able to afford the things for our families. We need to keep roofs over our heads. We need to be able to keep food on the table. And so we are working very hard in Harrisburg. That is something that I'm glad to say is that my caucus has been working hard to confront this, to call it out. We call it out in every circle with the business community. We call it out with calls with the chamber. We call it out because it's unacceptable. It is long past time that we move forward. And then another thing that is holding women back in terms of, as we look at the hope for the future, the quickest ways to help many women across the Commonwealth is to raise the wage. We have not had a raise in the minimum wage for so very long. It's been stuck at $7 and a quarter since 2006. And you think, well, you know, it's probably kids in the summer flipping hamburgers. Eh, 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 eh. No, there are at least 1 million women who are heads of households with dependents that are working minimum wage jobs, adults, not 15, 14, summer jobs, 16. No, adults who are working these jobs. So we really need to encourage the business community to pay women um, just by raising the wage at the state level. They would say, okay, well, this is what I can't go below. So maybe I'll have an incentive to get you to work for me. So that means that every state that borders us uh, Maryland is 1050, uh, or excuse me, $13. Delaware is 1050. West Virginia is 875. Um, we are seeing every single state around us, Ohio and New York included, with higher minimum wage. So we have to get that done at Harrisburg. I'm not going to get tired. I'm going to have a big drum on Monday when we're back in non voting session. <laughs> it's a good day to raise the wage in Women's History Month. Uh, <laughs> As I said, there are 1 million Pennsylvanians who are able to get an immediate boost with that. And thanks to our governor, Tom Wolf, who also doesn't get tired of 
fighting for it, talking about it, and making encouraging messages to my colleagues in the legislative body to change the law. And then the final thing that I'm going to look at, because I hope there's time for a little bit of Q&A, is the fact that we have to do more to bear the burden and help women as it relates to job loss and child care. To make a decision, is it going to make more sense for me to stay at home with my young child or pay daycare and go to a job where I might have paid gender equity problems, where I might be making minimum wage? Um, it's a problem. I'm hearing from employers all the time, we need people back, we need people back. It's like, well, you need to pay them appropriately so that they can afford the childcare. They're not trying to decide what makes the best financial decisions um, because we are seeing so many jobs that were booming before the pandemic, tourism, restaurants, these industry jobs, um, I'm not saying they're not coming back because we're seeing conventions return, but there are many women who worked in some of these jobs that have not yet returned to work. And it, it has to absolutely make sense. I mean, we've got to realize the fact that if childcare continues to go up, and I hear from child care providers in my district, we want to be able to pay the people who take care of children more. I mean, this is all going into the same calculation. We have to realize that there is so much that we can do to be able to help our children get the education, to be able to make sure that that average cost of child care being about $300 a week anywhere in the state. I mean, that is a lot of money. That is very expensive. I mean, we're talking 15 grand just, and that doesn't mean, you know, you might might choose a different place that's a little bit higher depending on what you're looking for for your baby or for your child. We have to be able to help bear the burden. We have to expand a child tax credit so that if you're not helped up front, you'll be able to see it in your pay less taxes because you have to pay that. It's very, very expensive. And that will help businesses and families alike. Another issue that we have been working on in Harrisburg is the Crown Act. Uh, we were all very excited, actually last Friday, for the United States House of Representatives to pass that legislation uh, on the federal level. Uh, this is, for me, year three. I'm working in the state house with my colleague uh, from Southwestern PA, from Pittsburgh, Representative Summer Lee. And on the Senate side, State Senator Vincent Hughes has the bill where we want Pennsylvania to have the protection in the Human Relations Code. Hello, you all know better than me. Where our hair, how we choose to show up and demonstrate our hair is not a basis for discrimination. I'm gonna share this and I'm gonna get ready to move on. My whole uh, legal education, I always try to figure out what's appropriate, what's professional, what looks nice, what doesn't. Uh, it's amazing to me that, you know, fast forward at 2022, I'm showing up how I'm showing up today. Because if you had ever asked, you know, would you go, you know, six years without pressing your hair? I would say, absolutely not. I have to do this because I have to look this way. I have to be remembered by these judges and these folks I'm interacting with. And I have to be respected by my clients who already think I'm a kid. So I want to look this way. I want to look that way. But regardless of how you want to look, and if you're a, a student playing athletics and you want to have a job covering your hair, uh, we need to be protected. We need to have the Crown Act in place so that there is no discrimination. You show up with locks. Uh, one of my godchildren, I got a picture, you know, she's growing her locks. She should never be told she can't play a sport because of her hair. She should never be told she can't get an internship because of her hair. I mean, it sounds silly if you haven't had these conversations, but I'm telling you, this is an issue that we have had to face, especially women more than men, not exclusively, but women more than men making a decision based on how we want to work out, how we want to, uh, you know, we want to sweat. We're going to change our hair. Like, what are we doing? I mean, there's so many factors. The average person is probably not considered this if it's not, you know, something that you struggle with or you're in the demographic. However, but nobody has had to say, well, I have to cut my hair in order to play this sport. That should be a question. No one, no athlete or any level is trying to make a decision. We were just talking about the Sweet 16 before we got started. Imagine at the Wells Fargo tonight. Uh, uh, uh. Hey, six fiver, um, I, you can't come out on this court. You've got to cut your hair before you do that. That sounds silly in this town hall conversation, but it is something that children have been subjected to. It is something that adults have been discriminated against. So we want to protect that. So I'm hoping that this year during our budget season that we can get the Crown Act done. 
Now, as we celebrate Women's History Month, we have so much to be proud of. I mean, we have made incredible strides and to put it into context, uh, my mom, who's a baby boomer says, I grew up, and this is a quote, I grew up in segregated North Carolina and my daughter's a state rep now in Pennsylvania and became the first woman to be a leader. So when we think about the progress we have made, the changes that have come, it's not like centuries. We're talking about one lady as a baby boomer, I mean, one extreme to the next, not able to use water fountains, not able to get in pools, not able to cross tracks in a small town in North Carolina to, you know, her daughter suddenly, you know, being able to be a constitutionally floor leaders in our constitution and having a woman after 244 years to do that. We've made some amazing progress. But as I said, I listed so many different issues. We have a lot farther to go. And we have to make sure that every single right we have from the right to vote um, to the right to be able to be active and to be leaders, that we don't take them for granted and that we ensure that we're making decisions uh, that we have folks around that have empathy and compassion and that they're committed to the progress to come because we still need to get a lot of things done for women across the Commonwealth. I hope this chat has been enjoyable and I hope that there might be an opportunity if anyone wants to contribute to the discussion. Um, this is not a class or a lecture, but I am so very grateful for this time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Representative McClinton, for those powerful remarks. Uh, so we're now going to transition into Q&A. Uh, I've been seeing in the chat lots of enthusiasm for the remarks. Uh, uh, lots of information from Edie Lassiter about uh, PHRC's uh, actions in regards to the Crown Act. I haven't seen a whole lot of questions yet, so I'd encourage you all to go ahead and uh, enter any questions that you have. Um, in the meantime, I'll take the opportunity to, to ask a quick question. I, I found it really uh, impactful what you were saying about uh, making sure that our firsts are not our last. Uh, what are some specific actions uh, that we all can take to make sure that we continue this momentum forward? Absolutely. So that is key. Uh, I, I think that it's multifaceted. We have to ensure that the people who are the first get um, honest feedback. Uh, <laughs> some of my colleagues say, what do you need? What do you need? I said, I need feedback. I, I am not like, oh, I'm the first and I've got the answers. I need you to tell me what is working, what we can do to improve our caucus, what we can do to improve our operations, what you've seen another leader in another state do, what you've seen a leader across the aisle do. I want to learn and improve. And in order for me to not be the last, for them to choose another woman whenever the time comes, um, I'm showing them that you know I'm not here and suddenly, oh, I'm the leader, I've got every solution in my left pocket. Like, no, this is still collaborative. This is still something that we need um, to have a team effort at doing. And I think we can continue to make opportunities. I know you all had a crowded schedule, but special thanks again to Chad to even give me this privilege. You all have so many women that you've had already. And the fact that you added another time just for me to speak, I mean, you're doing it. You're giving people the opportunity to talk about what they do day to day and to talk about how much further we have to go. And I know that one of the things that I'm able to do um, and that I can only do, you know, with the help of my team is getting in front of students, you know, getting in front of our children to make sure that they're thinking about it. Sometimes our children are disengaged and don't want to vote when they're 18 or 19 or 20. And they'll say, oh, what difference does it make? And, and how does it, uh, you know, change anything and really engaging them and challenging them. Because when we look at history, whether we're talking about women's suffrage or whether we're talking about the Civil Rights Act, those were young leaders, younger than I am now. They were young. So we have to make sure that our children are as engaged and challenged, that they're not satisfied with how things are, but that they have something that they're fighting for in their generation as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for taking me out, the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Um, I'd encourage anyone that has questions, please put them in the chat or feel free to unmute and, uh, and go ahead and, and ask Representative McClinton uh, what you have to ask. 
Representative McClinton, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I want to know what are your thoughts on how we reduce the adversity between males, our male counterparts, especially our black male counterparts, who we know are fighting the same sort of systemic racism and things that have occurred, but also look to us uh, sometimes as because we've achieved certain levels of, of, of position, you know what I mean? Like, how do we reduce the, the I don't know what to say, the, the, the adversity or, or the resentment that may come from our male counterparts, our black and brown male counterparts, when it comes to women who have achieved um, or at least are on the you know, impetus of, of achieving the, the, the hierarchy that we, we require or the, the positions of, of advancement that we have. How do we address that? And I'm That's sorry if I'm not clear. Point. Let me know if, I'm, if I need to clarify myself. No, I, I think I, I totally get what you are saying is that there can be at moments, um, especially in a professional setting, either animosity or resentment, um, kind of like a little less collaboration, like, hey, you've jumped the line because you passed me. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. So that is a very good question. And it is something that, you know, won't have one response, um, even from me, a lot of people approach it differently. I know that um, it is a challenge. I was uh, listening to, um, I was at a women's leadership last Saturday when one of my college friends was getting recognized by our alma mater, uh, LaSalle. And there was an MBA uh, executive woman who was giving the keynote address and said that, the hardest challenge she had was going from colleague, you know, to, you know, like a supervisor or boss or the executive on the team where people just thought, you know, they could interact the same way. So I know that the first key is to be, you know, continuously respectful, continuously welcoming and uh, making sure that um, that, you know, they don't feel ostracized. I've had like childhood friends that I'm still very good friends with one. I'm not talking about a lot of people to say, oh, well, Joe, you know, you're big now. What? <laughs> I take the trash out on Tuesday nights, like all my neighbors. I'm not big about anything. What are you talking about? There's nothing big here. Are you kidding me? I do laundry every weekend like you. I'm trying to like fold clothes and put them away. I'm trying to pick up dry cleaning. I mean, there's like, no sort of you're big now, but this childhood friend of mine is a male, also a lawyer, and just was like in his perspective thinking, well, you know, you're doing this, so you must be on a different level. And I just had to be as much of myself as I, I am every day in every space. I said, no, that is not the case. If that's what's in your mind, that's you telling you that. Like, I'm the same. Everything is the same. Of course, my schedule is a little bit busier, but nothing is uh, changed in terms of our friendship and the, the camaraderie that we've always shared. So you don't need to think somehow like, oh, your friend is now, you know, not reachable. She's on another level. She's doing more of this and more of that. It's like, please, I'm around. I'm here and, and I'm still willing and want to still be friends. Like I don't, nothing has changed, but I know that many times people just get intimidated. They get a perception in their mind of what you're doing because you got a promotion, because you got a raise and they figure, oh, you know, we can no longer be friendly. But I know for myself, I take the effort on me. I, I reach out. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I don't have endless time to reach out if you're not going to reach back, but <laughs> I'm definitely going to be clear. Like, I'm here and I still want to be connected and I still want to learn and grow. As I was using the example with my colleagues, I recognize that um, as my neighbors say, she's in charge of the Black Caucus. I said, I'm actually not. We have a great chair, <laughs> shout out to her, but I'm in charge of the House Democratic Caucus, which is not a Black Caucus. It is a very diverse caucus of people of all colors, predominantly male, um, you know, so I recognize like I am the minority in this organization. I am not, not like, oh, you know, we are, 90 colleagues and 80 of them look like me. No, it's not the case at all. And because I'm cognizant of it, I also make the effort to be accessible and to put myself out the way at times so that my colleagues and my members know like, no, we're on the team. Like you might call me coach this term, but I might be next to you next time. Like we're on a team. I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. I'm here to be responsive, but it is a challenge and it is very difficult to navigate because you want to keep good 
good space and you don't want it to seem like, oh, it's just you in a corner. Like you want to keep folks at the table and together. So I encourage you to work on it. And when there appears to be a challenge and it's someone you really, the relationship is meaningful, spend time, spend the time because you rather have um, the relationship remain meaningful um, than to be something that just fizzled out out of you know jealousy when it didn't need to be that case. State Rep, before we, we wrap up, um, and others may have a question, I, I just wanted to ask you um, if you could share uh, what's being done, if anything, um, from a policy standpoint uh, for women who are incarcerated, who are attempting to navigate those multiple things that you articulated. And this question emerges from my, my big sister, uh, Marsha Curry Nixon. She, she's in, in this Zoom virtual with us. And she and I, prior to COVID, uh, did about 10 or so sessions with women um, who had been formerly incarcerated. We did a lot of work uh, in our two state correctional institutes with uh, women who are trying to navigate that, getting reacclimated back into the community, dealing with the systemic uh, and structural racism, as well as the stereotypes of women who had been formerly incarcerated. And so are there anything, uh, any things that are occurring policy-wise that you can speak to that that's really trying to help shape new identities for this population that you could briefly share with us? Absolutely. So I, for that, I can give a big highlight to one of my colleagues who's also in West Philly, a Representative Morgan Cephas. She has really uh, taken it upon her legislative agenda to advance policies for incarcerated women. Um, she's been a few terms working on different bills for the dignity for incarcerated women, to make sure that women are never shackled during childbirth, to make sure that they get an extended period to bond with the child. Um, one of the things that she was successfully able to do, thanks to Governor Wolf's partnership, is ensure that there's access to doulas for women who are incarcerated so that they are able to um, not be at risk. Maternal mortality, in case anyone is not familiar, is very high in Pennsylvania, and it is almost double for women of color. Um, and as a result, you know that is something that she's been working on. We've all been truly supportive of it. One thing we were able to get passed last year was an automatic enrollment um, on Medicaid for women coming out of custody so that whatever types of treatment they were getting in custody, whether at Cambridge Springs or whether at SCI Muncie, that they can get that back home. They can get their treatment, they can get their help, they can get their medicine um, so that they can can take care of themselves. But some of the other organizations that we have been working to get state funding to enhance and improve and even expand, I don't know how many of you in the Philadelphia region are familiar with Toni Willis. She has an incredible story of triumph in her own personal life. She runs an organization called Ardella's House. The first lady of our Commonwealth, Frances Wolf, came down two weeks ago to join uh, Representative Seafish, Representative Donna Bullock, who is the chair of our Black Caucus, and many others um, to look at that reentry center because so much comes from mentorship, peer mentorship from women who've been in similar situations and been able to advance um, their lives and overcome the obstacles. Um, I know that one of the visits I had to SCI Muncie, it might've been the first one, uh, the gentleman that was touring me around said, women who leave here are told no for job applications, minimum 50 times. And how much of a strong will it takes to be able to rebuild your life when doors consistently are shutting your face. You know, entry level jobs where you think, oh, I can get this job. And they say no um, over and over and over again. Housing opportunities. Uh, so it is something that we have to emphasize a little bit more and definitely double down on our financial commitments and to change the policies so that there are less barriers for these women. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Um, because we're coming up uh, upon the two hour time and we wanna thank uh, State Rep for her time. Are there any more comments and or uh, questions uh, really briefly that uh, folk may have for our State Rep? And, and if not, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we all certainly have other things that we can jump back into as it relates to our social justice initiatives. Okay, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, once again, we wanna thank our ASL uh, interpreter colleagues. We wanna thank the and organizers for this. We wanna thank uh, State Rep Joanna McClinton uh, and everybody have a upcoming blessed uh, and safe upcoming weekend. Enjoy and embrace it throughout. State Rep, thank you so very much. Thank you kindly. Have a great Women's History Month. Take care, everybody. <laughs>